Hey, Rick, what did you eat last night? Oh, you know, this wasn't very exciting. God, I broke down and I went back to one of my old habits where I basically got my store-bought pizza Mm -hmm. and put that in the oven. And that takes like 25, 30 minutes. It was fine. It was thin crust. But the other terrible habit I have, oh my God, which I haven't done in so long, is I buy that canned cheese dip that's just so fake (laughs) and so orangey. And you know it's just eating away your arteries as it goes down and probably your Mm -hmm. intestines. And I eat that with chips. So I ate that while the pizza was cooking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somebody just put on Facebook the other day, does anybody else prepare a meal while they're waiting for dinner to be ready? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, totally. That's me. <laughs> yeah. How about you? I had, um, I busted out the grill. So I had um, grilled chicken breast, which I just brine and season and throw on there and some grilled broccoli and grilled sweet potato wedges with a honey mustard mint dipping sauce. Ooh, that sauce sounds wonderful. Oh my God, it's so good. And I'm always looking for things to do with mint because I grow mint and I'm not as, I don't use it as often as I think I would like to. So I'm trying to get more mint in my life. So this is a great way. It's terrific. It sounded weird, but it's really good. Nice. Hello, and welcome to another episode of You Won't Believe What I Ate Last Night. I am Rick Fiore. And I'm Kate DeVore. And this is our ongoing conversation about food, weight management, and our endeavor to be and stay healthy in a really tasty world. With love, kindness, and compassion towards ourselves and others. Today, we are talking about our favorite go-to healthy recipes for winter. We also want to give you a heads up about a format change that we have coming up. So we are going to start doing a monthly topic. So as you know, because you listen all the time, so we know you know these things, we do two episodes a month. So we're going to start having one topic that we're going to have two episodes on. And one of those episodes is going to be an interview with an industry expert on that topic. And then the other episode is going to be more like this format where Rick and I are discussing it just ourselves. So just a heads up that that's coming your way. If you have thoughts on that, if there's anything you want us to talk about, if you know anybody that we should interview, please get in touch with us because we're currently in the planning phase for what we're going to shift into probably in the spring, I'm guessing, is when that's going to actually show up. Um, It's very exciting. Yeah, we're super excited about it. So back to this current episode. So Rick. What's the value of having go-to recipes? Well, there's definitely the major one that it tends to save money, right? Because Mm. the idea is you're going to cook at home and that's going to be a little bit cheaper. So that's one. The other one is that you you have the ability to put in healthier ingredients, to control the ingredients that are put in, particularly all the little extra stuff that goes into making something super fatty Mm -hmm. or unhealthy. And that also includes natural ingredients. You have the ability to put in natural ingredients. Mm -hmm. The big one that I like is portion control. Mm. Ideally, you can make just the amount you want or a little bit extra if you want it for the next day or to freeze it. Hmm. And obviously you can avoid. <laughs> That's funny because I, I, I'm going to bring up my mother yet again. <laughs> yeah. um, she is like, why would you ever just cook for one person if you're alone? Like she makes a vat of everything. So, oh you God. know, that expression, cook once, eat twice. So I always make enough for like six meals probably when i make most of these things that we're talking about here so i i I, more power to you on the portion control but none of these (laughs) ones would i ever go to this kind of trouble for one meal (laughs) i agree with you because it's something that's always on my mind because there's a lot of meals that i want to make but i often don't because i know i can't eat them for a week Or I know that they won't freeze well. Mm. So I'm actually starting to think about how do I make more of what I want, even if it only lasts for a day or two. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally, yeah, I'm going to try it. I'll report back. Do you? The other thing is you can obviously avoid food allergies and any sensitivities you have. The idea is that, and obviously one of the reasons we're talking about it is because it's the idea that it's going to lead to a healthier lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. Less eating out, more eating at home. This is the other one that I came across, which I thought was super interesting, is the idea that it saves time. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I get that conceptually, but I'm not really sure if I agree with that. <laughs> well, so that's like, back to my theory is if you make six portions of it and you yes. put it in the fridge or you freeze it in portions, then you pull out this amazing, delicious home cooked thing that you love and all it takes is the time to reheat it. So Agreed. I think yeah, that's totally. the thing. Yeah. 
And then the other one is it reduces the carbon footprint, which I sort of get conceptually, too, because I know you're going out to a store and, you know, all the things that are involved. I know there's generally more involved in getting going out to a food store. But I also feel like there's so much involved nowadays in getting the groceries to your store and then getting the groceries home to you. What do you, do you think? Do you think what do you think about that? Boy, I don't know enough about that to have an opinion what the carbon footprint is of going to the grocery store relative to eating in a restaurant. I, I really, boy, that's outside my realm of knowledge, I have to say. Okay. All right. I was hoping you might know. I might. Yeah. I thought you might, one of those things you might have stored up there, Kate. You never know. <laughs> I know some things, but that's it's not true. one of them. This is why I asked you. You never know what you have in your head. I'm constantly surprised. It's true. <laughs> no one's final... mentioned that on the Food Network, though, so I'm out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the final thing I thought was interesting. And this is a number that you can generally find all over the Internet. It's over the past year, Americans are spending more at bars and restaurants mm. than they are in groceries for the first time since we've started recording how much people are spending on money on eating out versus groceries. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, but it's not surprising if I yeah. go out to dinner once. I will spend more on a moderate meal with maybe two drinks, which is probably what I'm likely to have, depending on who I'm with. I will spend more on that than I would in a whole week of groceries for cooking at home. So there's really no surprise about that. Agreed. I think the f- the big number they jo- they bandy about a lot of numbers, but the general consensus is it's fifty four or just under fifty five billion that's spent on eating out, and just like fifty two billion that's spent on groceries that you take home. So much money. Wow. I know, right? This is in the U.S., I'm yeah. assuming. So we're spending $107 billion a year on the combination of groceries and eating out. That's interesting. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a little overwhelming. Yeah. All right. So what's one of your favorite go-to recipes? Let's dive in. This is one of my favorites. So I love to make a curried red lentil soup. Mm. So this is something that I started. I've tried many numerous recipes and I've sort of doctored it over time. So it's really super tasty because it's basic. It's really simple and it's really easy. And it starts, you just heat a little oil and red pepper flakes in like a big lidded pot. And then you add onions. Mm -hmm. You're going to add shallots and curry powder. And obviously you cook that for a couple minutes. So it all sort of so you use onions and shallots. Yes. Okay. All right. Do you not normally do that? No. Mm. Because shallots are so mild that I always figure they're going to be overpowered by regular onions. So that's cool. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go and on. And you cook them for a couple of minutes and then you add red peppers and cook until and until you cook until all of that stuff's a little bit soft. And then you're going to add some garlic and I saute that for like a minute. And then I add mushrooms and you can really use any mushrooms that you like. But I sort of like shiitake mushrooms because I just think they're like far tastier. Mm-hmm. And, you you know, you stir all that up until everything's coated. And then basically you stir in broth and you bring to a boil and then you add lentils and then some basmati rice. And then you just cover it, let it simmer for like 25, 30 minutes. And you have really the most delicious soup you could ever possibly wish for. So you don't have any seasoning in there yet. Obviously, you'll salt and pepper at the end, but there's no spices, no seasonings other than the onions and stuff. Yeah, and the curry powders. So yet in the beginning, you add onions, shallots, and curry powder, and that's what Sorry, you're cooking. Sorry, I missed all the, the curry no powders. Worries. That makes much more sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's super simple, and you know we'll have all these recipes on the website, and but also the, so I you know we, we you and I both like a lot of spice, so I tend to add a lot mm-hmm. of curry powder, and I tend to do a little bit extra garlic. So mm-hmm. then you know so that's all going to be up to you. But, you know, it's so super tasty. And, you know, me without with being a vegetarian, the protein thing is super important. So it's yeah. really, it just satisfies me on so many levels. That's very cool. My yeah. understanding is that when you're using lentils, it's better to not salt them until the end, because if you salt lentil water and lentils as they're cooking, it toughens them and it takes a lot longer for them to cook. Really? Because mm-hmm. generally I season as I go. So I season every layer of a dish typically, which means I put salt in every step, just a teeny bit on every step. But oh, if wow. I'm using lentils, I, I won't do that because it will take them a lot longer to cook. Oh, that's so interesting. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's probably salt in a curry powder, but that's minimal. Again, one of those lovely things that you have stored <laughs> up in your noggin. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Well, that sounds delicious, and I would like it right now. (laughs) (laughs) Hold, please, while I go prepare. (laughs) (laughs) That would be so awesome. (laughs) How about you? What's one of yours? Well, funnily, my first one I was going to talk about is also a curry. um, Oh, fun. But a vegetable curry. 
So Mm. one of the things I love about this is you can use absolutely any vegetables you like or have in the fridge. So several of these things, I think, can be really useful for just using up vegetables that are going to go bad and you need to use them. It's sort of like an alternative Mm. to a stir fry or a smoothie. Those are my other ways of like, what am I going to do with these four things that don't really go together? (laughs) So shove it into something. (laughs) Exactly. Cook it all up. So the curry is really good for that. So this I love because it's so healthy. It's so good for you really relatively low in calories, relatively low in fat, and it's good fat that's in there. And um, it's very satisfying to me. So you start with a little olive oil, and uh, then you saute the basic triumvirate of seasonings of Indian food, which is going to be onion, ginger, and serrano chilies, or jalapenos. Mm. And as you may know, when you work with chili peppers, the heat is in the ribs and the seeds. So that's what you take out if you don't want it spicy, but you still want the flavor. Serranos are a little spicier than jalapenos, but I like them better because they have a flavor that's really sort of green and vegetal. So they have a taste, not just Mm. a heat factor. So Mm -hmm. I would rather take the seeds and ribs out of a serrano and use that instead of using a jalapeno with the seeds and ribs, you know. So the amount you use is your own thing. And then I season immediately with salt and a little bit of curry powder. So at this point, I'm saying we're using a jarred curry powder. And then you dice up all your veggies in advance before you do this, which is the time consuming part. And then I I saute them a little bit dry before I add the liquid and I put them in order because some of them take longer to cook. So the first things I put in are sweet potatoes and carrots because those take forever. And I just let those toss, you know, like you said, you make sure they get coated. And then I season again, a little salt, a little curry powder and let that cook for a little bit. I don't know, maybe five minutes. And Mm. then I would add cauliflower and green beans in the next one. And then again, season again, toss to coat, then a little bell pepper. I tend to add in there, usually uh, depending on the color of what else is in my dish, I'll find a color that looks good. So in this one, (laughs) I have sweet potatoes and carrots, so I would use a red bell pepper, maybe a yellow one. Then I'd put in the liquids, which in my case, I use um, coconut milk. And I like the reduced fat coconut milk. It's not quite as creamy, obviously, as the full fat, but it's really not very unhealthy. So the the whole can of coconut milk of the one that I buy has 250 calories of fat and it's good fat. Coconut milk is a healthy fat. And you don't notice a difference between them? The oh, taste? no, I do. Like, it's do not or... as creamy. Absolutely. Oh, okay. It's not as creamy. Wow. That's just, you know, you can't. <laughs> can't sub it out and nothing low fat is as good as the full fat version dude you know that it's never gonna be as good totally. i always but, think about sour cream how i hate low fat sour cream anytime anyone someone's tries to sub it out i'm like oh it's such a disappointment the only thing i agree completely there's no point but the only thing i think i can't tell the difference or i don't mind is cream cheese i think that neufchatel low fat cream cheese is totally oh, fine interesting okay yeah. but nice. mayo i use low fat mayo and it's not as good but it's okay But Mm. um, the coconut milk, it works fine. It really does work fine in this. Um, Good to know. Yeah, I love it. So I put a can of that, maybe some chicken or veggie stock, depending on how many vegetables I have and how much liquid I need. If I'm going to use canned tomato, which sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, this is when I would put it in. Season again, stir it up, and then I let it simmer for a little while, basically until the vegetables are tender. And then toward the end, I add some frozen peas that I've defrosted, a can of chickpeas that you rinse, obviously. And then at the very, very end, some fresh spinach. You can just mound it at the top and cover it up and let it wilt Mm. and then stir that all in. And then I serve it with uh, lime juice and cilantro, maybe a little yogurt and maybe a little mango chutney or something with it. And uh, you're supposed to serve it with rice. Basmati rice would be great with it. I tend not to. I like it fine without it. God, that sounds great. Oh, my God. It's so good. It really is so good. Does that freeze well with the coconut? Yeah, it does. Perfect. Yeah, it freezes really well. that's something that would be really great to make an entire vat of. I do. I fill my entire Dutch oven when I make that, typically. Because it's, it's a little bit of a process. But really, the chopping of the veggies is part of the biggest one. But if you kind of use one of everything I said, it's going to fill a huge pot. So, <laughs> yeah, I make a ton of it and freeze it in portions. It seems like once you just start baking, if you have all the stuff pre-cut, then that whole part seems super easy that you're just adding stuff in as you want. Exactly. And then you taste it for seasoning as you go. Can I jump back to the seasoning and layers thing that you said? So mm-hmm. are you is it just salt or are you doing other seasonings too? The curry powder. The salt curry and curry powder. powder. Okay. And depending on the curry powder I use, I might add a little cayenne. 
I have different curry powders that I go to. So if it's one that's a little milder and I want it spicy, I'll add a little bit of cayenne. But it also depends on how spicy my my chilies were. So maybe I will or won't use cayenne. Oh, my God. Please go make that for me now. Get on a plane and bring it here. (laughs) Did you know... Hey, Rick, did you know that aspartame and MSG, you know, monosodium glutamate, Mm -hmm. are called excitotoxins, which cause neurons in the brain to literally excite themselves to death? And as much as much fun as that sounds like, it actually suggests that they promote cancer growth and its propensity to spread. Wow, that's heavy when you think about it like that. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So I'm now throwing into the arena, Kate. I am making throwing in a quinoa burger. Awesome. Now, this is a burger I found from this book literally called The Best Veggie Burgers on the Planet. It's super Ooh. awesome. Ooh. And this is a quinoa-based veggie burger, which is my favorite. And I've really tried just about everything you can. I've tried burgers with a mushroom base, any type of bean base. I've done the textured vegetable protein. Mm-hmm. And this is the one that really sort of satisfies so many needs. I think they're actually really beautiful when you make them. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of, lot of... um protein and this really great vegetables do these freeze well these freeze super well i have about seven more in my refrigerator so i actually double and then triple Mm. this recipe a couple times and then i package them up i wrap them up and store them away and they're a really great thing to eat on the run they're a really great thing to throw on top of a salad i very Uh, rarely eat them on bread top of a salad yeah it's great and then you just break it up and you have this oh my god this great little mixture it's oh my really god quiet. and it's sort of like it's way better than a protein bar if you're just grabbing something to eat in the car right you can <laughs> yes exactly, exactly oh my god i am i'm literally salivating and i haven't even heard the recipe yet i'm so excited okay <laughs> here we go all right hold on so here's what i love is you're going to start with a dry pan and then you heat the uncooked quinoa in the pan until it begins to pop so you get that sort of sweet toasted flavor in the quinoa And then you also have some broth going. So I have a vegetable broth going. And then I add the vegetable broth to the quinoa. And I just let that cook until all of the broth is absorbed like you do with any quinoa. And you move from the heat, let it fluff, blah, 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 all that stuff. And this is where the easy part is. And so you've toasted the quinoa, you've boiled it, you've got your quinoa. Then in a large mixing bowl, all you're really combining are cannellini beans, peas, cashews, curry, ginger, tahini and olive oil Mm. you mush and that's what the rest of me piece says mush Mm. all of that together until you get it nice and chunky you let it refrigerate for like 20 minutes i do it overnight sometimes just because you know if i don't want to do it all in one day and then of course it comes out you make it into patties and then you just have to fry them in like a little bit of oil because pretty much everything's already, you know, well, the quinoa is cooked and the vegetables, mm-hmm. I like them and, you know, I like them a little bit crunchy. So I don't grill them that much, but I grill mm-hmm. them in the olive oil just to get a browning on each side and then mm-hmm. everything holds together. And this is really the key for me of all the veggie burgers I've done. This is the one that doesn't fall apart in the 11th hour <laughs> <laughs> when I'm cooking it. And more importantly, when I eat it. Because so many wow. times when you pick up a veggie burger to eat, it just freaking falls apart, even in restaurants. I'm like, really? I'm dropping it on my yeah, shirt. Yeah, no, it on my totally. Sh- and there's no binder in there, right? There's no egg. There's no flour. There's nothing that is a binder, really? Oh, a little. Okay, yeah. So you're going to throw, I'm sorry, a little bit of cornstarch. Yeah, a little oh, bit of cornstarch. Yeah, cornstarch. Yeah, thank you. Just dry? You don't make yeah. a slurry out of it or anything? Yeah, just throw that in. What else? Uh, yeah. After the tahini, yes, I forgot. After the tahini paste, you add the cornstarch. That's one of the things you throw in the bowl and just bind it. Now, I've also made this recipe, too, with eggs, that instead of the cornstarch, this is one I didn't really understand what cornstarch was. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would just crack some eggs in there, and that works just as fine. Hmm. And then you just, they're so tasty. And everyone I've given one to always loves them because what's so great is when you put the peas in, the peas just, they don't break up or anything. They're always just sort of, you know, they're there in the design of the food. So it always looks so beautiful. I want to try one when I'm there this weekend. Oh, fine. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Pull one out. (laughs) Um, Okay, I have questions. Do you, the the cashews are chopped? They're not whole cashews, are they? No, they're finely chopped cashews. So you chop those first. And the beans, the cannellini beans, do you mash them up or do you kind of leave them whole? Just put them in whole because when you mush everything together, the beans are going to get they're going to get a little mushed. mushed. Yeah. But the peas don't break, but the cannellini mm-hmm. beans do. The peas can break for the most part. They stay together. And then the last question is, do you use white quinoa? I do use white quinoa. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. OK. Amazing. That sounds so good. And I just recommend it because it's such high in protein. So many great vegetables and it's a good meal on the run. 
Yeah. And again, good fat, good carb. It's got yeah. it's got a lot of that stuff that's really great. Yum. Awesome. Now you, my darling, what's up next in your offering? All right. My next one is a root vegetable soup. Yum. Yeah, totally. So uh, I love this. I love this soup so much. And you can, again, you can vary it a little bit. Sometimes I've been known to roast the vegetables, but I don't know that it's worth the trouble, to be honest, because it's so good as it is. So you slice up a lot of onion. And you saute it in a pan until it basically caramelizes. So you still get some of that brown flavor in there, even mm. though you're not roasting it. And that takes forever. It takes <laughs> long, longer. Caramelizing onions always takes longer than you think. So The first time I saw our onions caramelized in person was with you. And I was exhausted by the process. <laughs> and I kept being like, they're not done yet. I was they're like, no, done they're yet. done. They're done. And Kate's like, yeah. no, they're not done. <laughs> exactly. So for a big vat of soup, I'd use like something in the neighborhood of two large onions and then two medium potatoes, just white potatoes that you dice up. At least four carrots, four to five carrots that you dice. And you want to cook the, cut the carrots really small because carrots, I always forget how long they take to cook. They take longer than anything. Mm. They take longer than potatoes. They take forever. So if you Good cut advice. them small, then you'll be OK. But if you cut them too big, then you're just boiling the soup forever, which is OK. It doesn't hurt the soup. It's just you're standing there forever waiting for it to be done. So cut the carrots little is my tip. Um, a large turnip that you peel and dice. A great handful of parsley, including the stems, and two or three sticks of celery, including the leaves, which, you know, we don't get celery leaves anymore. They cut them off in the store if you buy them in the regular grocery store. So I always pick my bunch of celery as the one that has the most leaves on it because that's where a lot of the flavor really is. Oh, how funny. I don't think I've ever put celery leaves in anything, Kate. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They have a different flavor and a flavor that I actually prefer. So after you've caramelized your onions, you just toss all those veggies in there and saute them for a few minutes and let them start to soften. And then you add the probably about seven or eight cups somewhere in the neighborhood. It depends on how much you have in your pot and all that. You know, you want to cover what you've got of stock. And so you could either use veggie stock if you want it to be a complete vegetarian soup. You could use chicken, whatever. I add a little Marmite in mine, which is a weird... (sighs) You know, you know what Marmite is. I do. You tr- I've really tried to like it around you. I yeah, have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a yeast vegetable protein, but you would like it in this soup because it disappears. It just makes it okay. salty and, and tasty. It doesn't taste like Marmite. Unfortunately, I would like Marmite soup, but that's just one of my random things. But just you good stuff. You would stock. like Marmite soup? Yes, I would. I can oh. eat Marmite just off the spoon, dude. People, so yeah, if absolutely. you could see my reaction whenever I put Marmite in my mouth. You would think my head was going to explode. It is a very divisive product. Most people either absolutely love it or absolutely hate it. Very few people are like, I could take it or leave it. Like you either like it or you don't. I learned this very early about Kate, this Marmite thing. And I really do remember many years ago, I was like, what the hell? Yeah. What have I gotten myself into this person that likes this thing? (laughs) I know it's crazy. My mom and I introduced Krista, who Krista, you might be listening to Marmite and Krista loved it. So, but it's similar. Some people say it's similar to Vegemite. I've never tried Vegemite, but it's a yeast vegetable extract spread that you put on toast typically. And um, it's very, very salty (laughs) and black in color. (laughs) So it's, it's unappealing looking. People would say, but is the night it is. Oh my God. I love it. Um, All right. So you put your veggies in then you put your stock in with or without marmite (laughs) and that's when you put the parsley in i know i i listed the parsley earlier but i would put the parsley in then and then season with some salt and pepper bring it to the boil which takes a surprisingly long time with eight cups of stock it's the (laughs) timing that people forget about when you're making a recipe it's like bring to the boil okay it's like well that might take 10 minutes you know right um and then reduce it to a fast simmer and let it simmer, a pretty high simmer for 20 to 30 minutes covered until the vegetables are tender. So just until they're tender, however long that is. And then I like to use an immersion blender at that point to smooth it all out. Or you could put it in a regular blender mm. if you want. But an immersion blender is so much easier and less annoying. And that's it. And oh my gosh, it's so good. God. Now, can I ask, is that the soup you've probably made for me in the past? Probably. I have <sighs> definitely made it, right? I remember loving it. And that was one of the first times I had a root vegetable soup. Mm-hmm. God, that sounds tasty. Oh, I want that now. I know. I this We should have eaten before we did this because I want all of these things and I'm salivating. Yeah. I'm certainly not going to go raid the fridge after this. Nope, not me. No. Um, that curry recipe I think I made up basically. This one was my mom's just to sort of give credit where it's due. Aww. All right. Hey, did you know... 
Hey, Kate, did you know that Central Appalachia's tooth decay problem is referred to as Mountain Dew Mouth due to the beverage's popularity in the region? No. Yeah. I did not. <laughs> Tough times. All right. So my for my final contender here, I'm throwing in a yellow mung doll recipe. So, you know, yellow doll, it's basically lentils. The idea is anytime, I think if I understand things correctly, when it takes on the term doll, that just usually means the lentil's been split. So doll is usually like a split lentil versus a whole lentil. And this is one of these recipes that I've come to love over the two years when I was introduced to it by my Ayurveda clinician. I first thought, oh, I'm never going to eat this. This is so dumb. I'll never make it. But it's really become a staple. It's so easy, easy to make. So the first thing is it's going to be a cup of yellow mung doll, which you can buy on Amazon anywhere. Yellow lentils, whatever it is. You wash them. You can soak them overnight. I don't, actually. I just throw everything in the in the water when I do it. There's going to be a half a cup of balsamadu rice involved. So I start by taking like a half to a tablespoon of butter or ghee. I just put that in a pan. I add three or four cloves of garlic, a small diced onion, and then I'm going to put in the spices of turmeric, cumin, coriander, mustard seeds, and fenugreek, and salt. And that's all probably like about a half a teaspoon of everything I do there. And then I basically, once I get all that going, I mix it all up with the spices and everything. I'm going to throw in the um, rice and the beans into that mixture. Just get all of those things coated so the spices get right into the rice and the beans. The beans? And then I, yeah. What beans? I'm sorry. The lentils. The, the lentils. Yeah, the, the lentils. Yellow, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, once that's all coated and really nice and scented, I basically add the water, like six cups of water, and you let it boil. This is a great slow cooker recipe. And then here's the other thing I love about it, which goes back to something that you did. You, sa- you stated in the beginning of this. I use this anytime I need to clean up any vegetables in the refrigerator because ultimately that's really good by itself, just the yellow lentils and the rice. But then you can add any vegetables you want that you want to get up. So my favorites are shiitake mushrooms and red pepper. And then I will also add just a big mound of spinach or a big mound of kale. And then you just let it boil. And that's like 25, 30 minutes, super simple. And at the end, I like to throw a big old handful of cilantro right into the pot, right when it's done cooking. And you just really have this tasty, tasty sort of, you know, bean thing that's really grounding. It's really flavorful. And it's so nutritious for me. So spectacular. Sounds terrific. I make a lot of dal, and it's amazing how good it is. I make it in the crock pot. I make it on the stove. Yeah. Various different things, but a lot of them involve very similar kinds of Indian spicing. And some of them I add spinach to. It's the same idea. And oh, my Lord, it's just so good. And it's literally like maybe 20 minutes. Of pre- I can do it in 20 minutes now. At first, of course, like any recipe, it's like whatever. It can take a while. But now that yeah. I got it down, I can do it for lunch when I'm home now. It's yeah. really great. It's fresh and it's there. And it freezes. Okay. It's not the greatest freezing, but this is one of those recipes that, I'll, that I've got the portions down that I can make it right there and then, and I won't freeze it. I'll just make it. Oh, see, it. I always freeze doll. I think doll freezes mm. beautifully, but mm. I don't put rice in mine, but still maybe right. that's it. I don't know. But, but rice freezes. Okay. So I don't know what, I don't know why there's nothing in that that wouldn't freeze. I would, I would think it'd be all right. The lentils don't get weird. I agree. It's an odd thing because, you know, I'm a big freezer. I yeah. freeze a lot, but this one, I'm always like, ugh, I never want it when I pull it out. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I think it's more me than it is actually the food. Well, you know, also when you freeze things, the flavor diminishes. So you need to reseason it when you heat it up. So if you don't add salt, there's something about freezing things that reduces salt. When you bring it back out, you always oh, need to salt stuff that comes out of the freezer. That. So it yeah. might be that if you don't reseason it, it's bland and it doesn't have the same hit. And are you saying just reseason it with salt or other spices? Too? I would start with just salt okay. and see how that went for you. Right. That might be adequate. OK, I'll try that. Because right. that stuff should freeze, I think, in theory, really well. Yeah. And boy, again, talk about a time saver. If you had a portion of that in the freezer, you mm. know, take it out in the morning and have it for dinner Yummers. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So good. And that to me is one of my Popeye foods, right? I eat it and I'm like, oh, I could go all day. Yes, yes, yes. I totally get that. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. I feel that way about lentils. When I combine lentils and quinoa in particular, forget about it. I I feel like I could take on the world. There's something about that combination that's really my body really likes. Nice. All right. So my last one, some people would argue whether this would belong in a healthy recipe discussion because it involves beef. Ooh, so, controversy, 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 controversy. So some people would say that beef is never healthy. 
I contend that a small amount of grass fed, humanely raised beef is fine. It's a good protein and I think it is healthy. So I'm putting it in here. This is the most amazing beef stew and it's one that you largely kind of throw in the oven and it cooks so i love it so here's the deal i have had a number of beef stew recipes over the year and years and this one combines the best elements of all of them to my to my knowledge that Mm, i've had so i don't even eat meat and i'm so excited (laughs) totally oh my god the smell of this you would adore so you need a dutch oven like you can't make it like this without a dutch oven so you want about three pounds of chuck beef That's pretty grainy. It's a pretty fatty type of beef and you cut it into one inch cubes. Now, the thing I love about this is you don't have to brown it, which a lot of stews you do, which is annoying and I don't like it. So you're going to throw that into your Dutch oven and then you're going to add four onions, four small onions. I once used way too much onion. So (laughs) I think four might be too bitch. Now that I'm looking at this, like two sort of big onions, the onions have become enormous, maybe two onions roughly chopped and Four to six cloves of minced garlic, depending on how much you like. The recipe is probably for four. I almost always double the garlic in anything. And then you cover it tightly and put it into a 350 degree oven. And then it starts to make a hissing sound in about 25 minutes. And at that point, you take it out and you add your liquid. So the liquid that you're going to add. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot something. In addition to the meat and the onions and garlic, you're also going to add a couple teaspoons of salt, a teaspoon of pepper, and some fresh thyme. Mm. Thyme and beef love each other. Dried thyme is okay. Fresh is better. It would be worth it if you could manage the fresh for this. Okay, so then it hisses after 25 minutes. Then you add your liquid. So you're going to add about two cups of liquid total, probably. Maybe about three quarters of a cup of red wine. Or you could add beer, if that's what you have on hand. Mm. I think red wine is my preference. But some people, you know, beer and beef also like each other. And then make up the rest with stock, either chicken stock or beef stock or veggie stock, or you could just use water if you wanted. And then maybe a can of tomato sauce you'd put in there and a large dollop of tomato paste, which you would actually want to, this is a picky detail, but you'd want to whisk the tomato paste into the liquid before you pour it in so it doesn't just sit there in a glob. (laughs) <laughs> so I love you, me a glob. you kind of get a bowl and you put all your liquid in with the tomato paste and you whisk it all together and then that's while it's in there and then when it comes out you just dump it all in then you just bake it for an hour and a half and then you could if you wanted take it out at that point cool it and refrigerate it and skim the fat off the top depending on how much fat was in there because if you cool something and refrigerate it the fat will come to the surface in a hard layer and you can take Mm. it off easier i don't always do that because i don't think i have as much fat in the beef as the original recipe where you were supposed to do that then i like to add vegetables to it that you par cook so when you're going to do it you par cook so partially cook some potatoes Green beans, peas, carrots, your choice. I definitely like a little potato, a little peas. That that's my that's my thing would be potatoes and peas. But you can add whatever you like. Add them to the pot, heat it through, maybe a little thyme and oregano. And um probably about a half hour you'd want to heat all that to get the juices into the veggies, except peas you just add at the last minute because they'll overcook really quickly. But the mm. potatoes. Then maybe a little bit of parsley to serve and it's delicious with a horseradish cream sauce. <sighs> Which is um, horseradish, sour cream, and mayonnaise, and salt and pepper, um, which again, horseradish and beef really like each other as well. So there we are. You've settled it. I'm going to start eating meat again. (laughs) All right. So here are my questions. Yeah. So this is the section we call, help a vegetarian out. So what's chuck? It's a particular cut of meat. I can't remember what part of the cow it comes from. It might be the shoulder. I don't know, but it's how it's labeled. Okay. But the thing that I would do is because I'm picky about buying grass fed beef, which is it's hard to always find whatever you want. So if you find a butcher that does it, I just make sure that I say I'm making a stew and I want it to be a marbled beef that's kind of grainy and has fatty fat that runs through it. That's what you Mm. want. You need some fat for this beef. You don't want really lean beef in a dish like this. Okay. And then the other question that came up for me, so talk to me about, I mean, that sounds like an amazing recipe, obviously. Talk to me about tomato sauce versus tomato paste. I've never really understood, because is tomato paste just a condensed version of something? Yeah, tomato, I don't know how they make it. Now that that you mentioned that, I've never thought about that. But tomato paste is, is, uh, well, it's a paste. So it is very, very condensed. And you would use a, like a, a big spoonful, like a tablespoon or two, and it adds a richness. It adds a depth of flavor because it's condensed. It has a more intense tomato flavor. 
So you would add that to bring out more tomato-ness and to add a little um, texture to the sauce. It thickens it just a little bit. Is it always an addition or is it a substitution for tomatoes? It could be either. Okay. I mean, you can't substitute it for fresh tomatoes. Okay. All right. But it can add a tomato-y flavor and a bit of richness to something. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to think if I've ever used it just by itself with no other tomato product and i don't think i have i usually use it to enhance other tomato-ness i get you okay yeah brilliant yummers so now people you guys listening we want to know what your go-to recipes are we want to make them we want to share them with our listeners so please go to our website and let us know what your favorite go-to winter recipes are you can email us at you won't believe what i ate at gmail.com visit our website where we will have a bunch of information up you can also follow us on facebook at you will believe what i ate last night send us pictures too of anything you make yes we want to put them on the facebook page we love questions and we love comments so if there's anything you want us to talk about please let us know if there are any comments on our show please let us know but you can just record an mp3 on your phone and send it to our email which is you won't believe what i ate at gmail.com and please subscribe on itunes as well as youtube as always our podcast is you know we really are so wonderfully supported by you people we love you have we mentioned that we adore we you love you so much mm-hmm. here's my heart here it comes Mwah. so <laughs> if you want to support the podcast you can do that on our website there's a paypal link there to give one dollar or one million dollars whatever you like um, <laughs> Yeah. I wish you could have seen the gesture that just went that with that. It was awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much. We love you. 